So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this is the uh, August Oz Seabed webinar. Um, but just to start with a little bit of housekeeping, housekeeping um, just to preserve the internet bandwidth, um, if you can please keep your video off and your microphone muted, unless you're presenting. We will have an opportunity to turn cameras back on just in a moment to take a, a group photo, but um, just hold them off for the moment for the time being. If you have any questions at any point in time, um, then yeah, please include them into the chat window and between B and Kim and Aero, they'll be monitoring those questions and comments in the chat, bo chat box as we go along. Um, and anything that we can't answer in the session of the webinar, then we'll look to get to publish at, or answer you directly or publish those on the on the Ausseabed website. So, um, and also today's session will be recorded and published to the Ausseabed website. For those of you who are unable to attend, you can you can jump back on and and rewatch it at all parts of it at any given time. So, firstly, to introduce myself, my name is Tim Ingleton, and I am am part of the Ausseabed. Um, steering committee and I am currently leading up the outreach engagement and training component of, of the steering committee itself. I'm a research scientist with the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment and I'm um, I guess as a, as a scientist out there on the ground collecting data um, back in the office processing data with colleagues um, and then using those products and, and things to do habitat mapping and hydrographic surveys and stuff for for the business of my department in New South Wales. So. Firstly, also, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and sea country in Australia on which we're meeting today, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So um, in Sydney here, we're meeting on Gadigal land and, and people of the Eora Nation. Um, so we'd like to pay our respects to Elders past and present, and especially extend our welcome to any of those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today as part of our webinar and, um, and seminar series. So you already probably have received uh, a, a bit of a, a rundown on, on what we um, will be covering today and starting off with a bit of general business um, from the steering committee itself. And then kicking off with uh, session one of the our quality assurance tool. Um, and that followed at about 11.40 uh, with one of the other tools that's being developed as part of the steering committee and, and the group um, about the, and the HIP request tool with the Australian Hydrographic Office. If we have time for break, we'll hopefully um, get a 10, 15 minute break in there sometime around lunch um, and then come back after lunch for a workshop, workshop session at about 12.30 on um, the Ozseabed, Ozseabed Marine Data Portal and some of the updates associated with that. And finally, um, to end off the day, we're going to be talking about um, a, a talk from ULIS uh, in w, WA uh, towards a national seismic derived bathymetry data set. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, OzSeabed is a collaborative initiative uh, of collectors and users of seabed mapping data. And the community spans state and Commonwealth government agencies, as well as academic and the private sectors and industry. So what we want to do is we want to improve the coverage, the awareness, the quality, discoverability and accessibility of seabed mapping data for the entire marine community across Australia. We want to ensure that all seabed data collected is made public and available for the benefit of all. So collect once and use many times is one of our mottos. And I just, yeah, just to say thank you for those of you who uh, are joining us for the first time today. We're always looking to expand the community and, and, and bring in um, new people and into, into, into the fold, I guess. And it's not us sitting on one side as the steering committee and, and you on the other as the community. We're all, work, all working together um, for those common goals. So just a quick update. Uh, also just introduce some of the changes to the Oz Seabed Steering Committee in 21-22. Um, and some of this was, for those of you who were in yesterday's session, some of this might have been covered already, but this is just for those who weren't. Um, then this year we had 11 nominations for the five different positions undergoing renewal as part of the steering committee. Uh, and the election process has seen IX Blue, so Jeff Laws, um, and the Hydrographic and Cadastral Survey um, with Richard Cullen, also joining a ASB steering committee for the first time. We'd also like to welcome back the re-election of um, WA Department of Transport with Ralph Talbot-Smith, uh, with NIWA and um, Kevin McKay, 
and also welcome back Mary, um, Mary Young from Deakin University in Victoria. So we look forward to having you uh, new members and the old members return uh, with us over the next couple of years. Also on behalf of the Osbeds Steering Committee, and we extend our thanks to the outgoing members um, from, we had a representative from Fugro in Hugh Parker and from Frontier SI in Clive Fraser and both, both made ex extremely valuable contributions during their tenure with the steering committee over the last couple of years. So thanks Clive and you. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Yusti Suabesi from uh, Geosciences Australia, Lachlan Hurst um, from Frontier SI and Matt Boyd uh, from CSIRO who are gonna give us a presentation on the quality assurance tool for Multibeam. Take it away Yusti. Do you wanna share your screen? Great. Thanks Yusti. Okay, you see now? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Okay. Um, hi, I, I'm Yusti Siwabesi from Geoscience Australia. Uh, and my colleague Lachlan Hurst and I will co-host and co-present this session on quacks. Uh, so the main objective of this session is to run a, a quacks tutorial. So before we run the tutorial, it is important that we provide you with background information first. In this session, I will provide you with the with a Quack's background. Lachlan will then take over and talk you through with objectives and benefits, as well as downloading Quacks. The next is Quacks training for hydrographic surveyors. I will replay a pre-recorded tutorial prepared by our colleague, Matt Boyd from CSIRO. Lachlan will then conclude with uh, the topic, where to next? And at the end, we will take questions and comments. A couple of years ago, uh, we had some workshop bringing together a large number of stakeholders discussing what the community would like to see out of a QA QC software package. There were lots of ideas. Apparently, uh, the community wanted a large number of abilities that perhaps were not available or being enabled by the major software vendors in the hydrographic space. In a nutshell, they wanted a tool capable of near real-time assessment, user-friendly, transparent in terms of codes, automated, standardized, and expandable. So after three years journey of OC, but have we got the tool yet? Well, hear what Lachlan has to say later on. The quick Quack's idea was born when representatives from NOAA and SICOM visited and participated in workshop here in Canberra in June 2019. Quacks is an open source collaborative project between OCBET, NOAA, SICOM that facilitates quality insurance of MBES data. Straight after the workshop, while NOAA and SICOM representatives were still working with OCB team in Geoscience Australia. Quack was created as a container to start OCB on its journey down creating what was an apparent need of the community. Still straight after the workshop, while NOAA and SICOM representatives were still working with us, the first iterations of a plugin called MATE was born here in GA. So we know there are more and more people doing their own stuff on multi-beam data that require them to write their own bespoke algorithms, readers and writers. A large number of libraries are being put on open source spaces like GitHub, for instance. So we took advantage of these open source repos. This slide shows those we've used. 
So Lachlan will provide more on this topic as he was one of those behind the success of the Quacks project. And over to you, Lachlan. Thanks, Yusti. So one of the great things about those early uh, workshop sessions that we had in the OZ Bed program was um, obviously hearing what people needed these quality assurance tools to do. But we also learned an awful lot about what people had already done when looking at the quality assurance of seabed data. Uh, so if you look at this, this slide here, we've got some of the big sort of typical um, geospatial and numerical processing libraries like NumPy and GDAL. And you, you wouldn't write one of these applications without those. But there's a lot of niche file formats, which you see mentioned. Um, and it turns out that there's already libraries out there to support a lot of these formats. So we at OzSeaBird were able to leverage a lot of what the community has already done. Um, and certainly the, the input from NARA and CECOM was um, quite influential in sort of pointing out what QA work they'd already done so that we could le leverage that in, in some of our tools and also look at integrating their tools within Quacks itself too. Uh, next slide, please, Yusti. So just to give you a bit of an overview as to how Quacks sort of comes together under the covers, I guess when, when you think about a, a quality assurance tool, um, what you really want the user to be able to go through and do is go through and specify, hey, I've got um, these, these files, I've got a selection of raw bathymetry files, some gridded files, maybe some point cloud and so on. I want to assess these against a, a number of input parameters. So maybe if you're looking at your bathymetry data, you want to define a, a minimum pin count or something like that. So you, you define what that minimum pin count actually is as one of your input parameters. Then you want to click a button that sort of goes away and, and does all the processing through all the checks for you. And out of that, you want a list of your, your check results and, and maybe some files that sort of help you identify um, specific regions of your data that have quality assurance issues, for example. So what Quax does is it sort of strings together that, that user flow. So it provides the user interface and it allows the users to go through, specify what files they're interested in, what input parameters, and it generates this thing that we've termed QAJSON. Um, it's a machine readable format, which is kind of human readable as well. And it really formalizes the input parameters and the input files into each one of the QA checks. The QA checks themselves are written in these things we call plugin modules. And we have a different plugin module for different types of checks. So we've got a plugin that supports um, some raw bathymetry checks. We've got some other plugin modules that supports checks on, on gridded um, data products as well. And we'll have another plugin coming soon, which integrates some of the, the NARA and CECOM Q, QC tools as, as well. The idea behind this plugin type architecture is that it means that you can go through and write a, a plugin with a, with a very small amount of code and have it integrated in Quacks. And what that gives you is the ability to have it displayed in a nice graphic user interface and have the management of your check execution being run for you. So for most users, they don't really need to care too much about the plugin architecture, but certainly if you're interested in seeing new checks added into Quacks, potentially even your own checks, it's well set up to, to do that. And we'll certainly have some documentation in place very soon to support that activity as well. Back to you, Yusti. Yeah, okay. So after all hard works by OCB team from GA, CSRO, and Frontier SI, and in particular, Matt Boyd, from CSRO and Lachlan Hertz from Frontier SI since early to 2020. We have now a QA QC software package that OCBIT community wanted. So it, it is also called Quax. So Quax is also a tool that provides an efficient workflow for checking multi beam echo sounder data. The tool standardized quality insurance QA outputs and assist the technician to perform a robust QA of data. As it stands now, Quex hosts three plugin, in, plugin tools in full operation and one placeholder for one another 
plugin tool that uh, Lachlan just mentioned before, QC tools. So six take home message about Quacks that we want to bring your attention to are, it offers near real time QA for MBS data that can be run online. Second, it allows interactive data querying for missing or Arano's raw data. Third, it bundles raw data parts from multiple sensors for easy downstream processing. It also provides external geographic outputs for direct visualization and for further analysis. And of course, it is an open source. And it is viable for developer to add the plugins. So I hand it back to uh, Lachlan. Thanks, Yusti. So Quax is available as a, as a Windows installation package. Um, you can download it from um, both the, the OzCB Quax homepage and, and the GitHub repository as well. Uh, you'll find a, a link at, at both those both those URLs to, to the download page. And we're sort of continually releasing new versions of, of Quax. Uh, we've just pushed out a v1.0 release. Um, so yeah, please download it and, and give it a shot. Back to you, Yusti. Thanks, Lachlan. I will now replay the pre-recorded Quacks tutorial for hydrographic surface prepared by Matt Boyd from CSIRO. He's another one of those behind the success of the Quacks project. So I'll uh, move across to the tutorial now. Hang on. Uh, okay. Oh, hang on. Let's start again. Yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Matt Boyd. I'm a CSIRO hydrographic surveyor working with Seabed, Australia's national seabed mapping coordination program. This is the first of two user story videos that will show you how you might use Quacks to check data as you are collecting it while you're out on a ship. Essentially, in this video, I'm demonstrating how you might use it if you were a hydrographic surveyor. So to start, I'm going to set up Quacks. Uh, I'm going to turn off the mate raw data checks and I'm going to move to set the parameters that I need to check to. In this case, I'm conducting an order 1A survey, survey. So the parameters I have for that standard are, I need five soundings for each depth computation um, on each grid node and 100% of those nodes to be, uh, to have those five, that's five soundings. For the resolution check, in any water depth less than 40 metres, I need at least two metre resolution, while in anything deeper than 40 metres, I need a resolution that, that is 5% of depth. I'm going to make the feature detection multiplier 1 and the depth threshold um, that is uh, 40 metres so that um, anything above, above and below this point I can set the parameters for. I said that anything less than 40 metres needs to be 2 metres, so I'll set a depth constant 
and for anything deeper than 40 meters i'll set a multiplier of 0 0.05 which represents five percent for vertical uncertainty i need to set a constant depth error of 0.5 and the factor of depth dependent errors to be 0.013 those values are pulled straight from the standards document that i have so that sets the embers grid check parameters i'll move on to the finder gc parameters the only parameter i'll change for finder gc is the laplacian operator and i'll change that to, to four that's all set up now, so I'll move across to the Run tab. I'm going to want to export the detailed information, um, and from here I'll switch over to a simulation I've got running in the background. So here my line work is being uh, processed and added to this Keras project as though I'm, in, I'm actually out there collecting it. As a new line is added, I'm generating a grid and exporting it to a GeoTIFF, um, and those, that GTF has the bands, depth, density, and uncertainty so that I can actually check it in quacks. So here's my exported GTF. That's going to continue being written to, so I'll make a copy of it. I'll then add that file that I made a copy of into my survey, my inputs, my survey DTM, so the copy, and then I'll run the check. That's now completed. And so looking at the summary information, I can instantly see what's what's failed. And so it looks like we have some holes, uh, we have some flyers, and we failed the density check, but the resolution check and vertical uncertainty are fine. So I need to investigate the three that failed um, in a bit more detail, and I'll use the external outputs to uh, to do that. In the meantime, my survey has been continuing, so I have more lines that have uh, been brought into my Keras project here. But what I need to do is go to my Explorer window and get into the detail. Uh, so I know that total vertical uncertainty and resolution passed, so it's just these three that I'm interested in. And I'll start with the density check. So I'm going to load in these TIFF files into the Keras project. So I've actually loaded in the surface that I computed these files from, uh, the survey area or the survey boundary, and also those failed uh, failed GeoTIFFs. And I can see that the the failing cells are these black black ones, and they're all around the edge of this particular. Um, survey. So the stuff that's failing is is not where I have overlap. It's out, and it's also outside of the boundary. So I know that I'm okay. I'm pretty sure that the uh, the density check is actually passing uh, within the survey bounds. Next, I'll look at Finder. So I've loaded in the results of the holes check, and all I'm going to do in this instance is just select um, those those identified holes, and it will highlight them. And it looks like all of them are outside of my survey bounds again. So from the perspective of holes, I'm all good so far. If I do the same with the flyers, uh, then it looks like there's only one that's been identified um, just here. And so I know that I need to do some processing to have a look at that and see if I can uh, process that process that one out. While that's been happening, the survey's been continuing. So I'm going to go back and I should have a, a newer version of my surface. I'll delete the original copy that I had. I'll delete uh, the original checks that I did. And I will just make another copy and see how far we've gotten. And run another set of checks. So with this new file, go back, remove the old one, add in the new one, and repeat. 
So the next check is done and we just do the same thing. Brief summary, looks like it's the same three checks that are failing. So firstly, looking at the failed density nodes, uh, you can see that they're all outside the survey boundary look to be. So I think we're all good there still. Uh, the ones that are inside the survey boundary should, by, should be covered by the next line, which has, has been collected now. If we switch across to the holes and we select that, this time we can just select. And you can see that the one the holes that are selected are predominantly outside the boundary, but uh, again, some of them along this this inner edge where we have another line to, to fill them in. So it should be okay. And flyers, again, just select. Oops, that was the wrong one. And it looks like it's identified four. Uh, that are quite close to the boundary or within the boundary. So we need to do some cleaning. And you just keep, keep repeating that process until you've completely filled in your survey. Uh, once your survey is completely filled in, you can clip it to your survey boundary and, that, uh, and then run that final check through Quacks. So I have created that final clipped surface. I'm gonna load that into Quacks and do one final check to make sure that everything is passing. So it's my clipped surface. All the parameters are still the same. And I want the detailed summary. I'm just gonna hit run. So that final check is done. We can have a look at the results. And now you can see that everything is passing. It's all green ticks. Okay, so that means that clipped surface is all good. I'm gonna go file, save as, and I'm going to save a QA JSON file that relates to our, the final surface that has passed. Save. So saving that file means that someone in the office or someone who wasn't on the survey is now able to open that file and it'll load all of those checks that were run straight out of that file. And the person in the office can see that all the checks have passed. Just one more thing to mention, if you're working with a processing package that uh, doesn't, isn't able to create a geotiff or a multiband geotiff, there's within the utilities a grid transformer utility that can take three bands, density, depth, and uncertainty, and combine them into one to use in Quacks. There are also some other uh, grids that are created through the check process, um, mainly the allowable resolution and the allowable uncertainty TIFFs that you can see here in Explorer. Um, those can also be loaded in as proofs in your reporting see that in here I've got the allowable resolution and the allowable uncertainty. So that's just calculated. It's a calculated grid um, that's used within Quacks to check against. And uh, that's how you might be able to use Quacks as a hydrographic surveyor. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this tutorial. As we end, I would like to acknowledge the Quacks contributors who have collaborated to make the, this release of Quacks possible. Okay, so that's the um, tutorial. Um, so um, 
if you can see in here, we have the training material is available uh, on this um, address here in the OCBET uh, portal. And we also have the feedback form. Uh, we would like you to actually um, uh, give us a uh, feedback. And uh, if look, uh, sorry, if um, if um, Aero can actually put that uh, uh, link into the the, ch the chat, then people can actually have a um, go to provide us with a feedback form. But I will actually launch that feedback form from here. So this is the feedback form. And we actually listed, you, you just provide your name, uh, your email address, and, and, and then we ask you some questions regarding the checks that we actually uh, the checks that are available in the in in um, in the um, in the quacks. So the first one is like a backscatter available, so the telemetry available, and so this one is actually inside the other plugin which is called Mate. So ellipsoid available, ellipsoid hide, file name check minimum pin count, ray tracing available, run parameters, positions, installation parameters, SVP file available, true HIF, and so, and so forth. Whereas this one at the, the MBES grid check, that's the one that um, Matt, um, that we showed you on, on Matt's video. And also we defined it, find it grid check as well. So, so you can you can go to the to the feedback form and we would like you to fill in and then we would like to hear from you. So that's it and then I will um, actually um, hand over to back to Hang on. To Lachlan, uh, where is my presentation? Uh, here we go. So here we go. Okay. So I'll hand back to Lachlan uh, for the uh, to lead the, uh, the the question as well. But before uh, we take questions and comments, um, he would have provide us with uh, the, what's next. Yes, Lachlan. Thanks, Yusti. Can you switch over to the next slide? So as Yusti was just saying, um, the, the next big thing that we'd like to get is feedback um, based on real world use of the Quacks tools and the checks that are included. Uh, we'd really like to know which ones you see as valuable, um, do you like quacks? Um, I'd encourage you to be as honest as, as possible um, in, in giving that feedback because it, it'll really help shape future development. Um, so point three there, scope quacks version two development. So what checks are missing? Um, what checks could be better? What checks are bad? Uh, we've got some ones lined up like integrating the, the QC tools and we've got some good pointers on how to go about doing that. Um, there's also some user interface changes, so um, support user input of specification. So early on in that tutorial video, you you might remember there was a list of like input parameters, and it was quite long and quite complicated. The reality is all those check input parameters can be usually read out of like a a, a specification matrix. So you might be interested in assessing your survey to IHO um, 1A or, or 1B specification. So you look it up in a table, read those ta table values out, put it in the form. Whereas what we'd like to do is just allow the surveyors to select, all right, this is IHO 1A, and it would just populate all those parameters automatically for you. We're looking at how the Quacks tool gets integrated into some of the automated processing work that we're doing at OzCBet as well. 
and there's a there's a number of other little minor tasks there. So I've got more than enough to keep us as busy with with quacks. Um, but I think the main priority at the moment is sort of gathering an understanding of where the community would like to see the tool go. Uh, so that's it. Thanks, Yusti. Oh, and questions, I should say. Um, I know we've got one in the in the chat from Andrew about the, the quacks density check. The quacks density um, check algorithm hasn't been changed. So I'd expect that is if there was a difference in the results, that difference would still exist. Um, it's certainly something we can look at, but I'd say the difference is going to come through a, a difference in the, the way they're actually implemented, so a different algorithm. And that's all I can say without looking into it further. Thanks, Lachlan. Um, anyone else have any other questions in the chat? It's not, not a lot coming up just at the moment. Yeah. Anyone has any 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 questions they want to add in, or they think that in in a, in a little while maybe we can come back to that at the end of the, of the next session. And so there's another one that's just popped up from Michael. Yeah. Um, so the, it's really a question for for Matt to to answer. I guess he's he's sort of more the bathymetry expert than than I. But yeah, the intention is that you could run um, some of the the Quacks raw data checks on raw multi-beam data as, as, it, as it's coming in, in in real time. Right. All right. Oh, well, thanks Lachlan and USD and also to Matt as well for his um, contribution. And yeah, that's um, an amazing tool. I um, encourage everyone to sort of go to the website and, and, and have a look and um, see how you might be able to start implementing it in, in, in your day to day. So just to get back to great. Okay, so our next presentation um, is from Commander Nigel Townsend, who works with the Australian Hydrographic Office. He's going to be talking to us about the HIP, the Hydro Scheme Industry Partnership Program and also the Ausbed Seabed Request Tool. So um, please take it away, Nigel. Hello, can you hear me now? Thanks, Nigel, yeah, we've got gotcha. you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, um, I'm Commander Nigel Townsend from uh, Australian Hydrographic Office, uh, Assistant Director of National Hydrography, and I have responsibilities for the, the planning of uh, HIP activities, uh, the operational management of those activities, and the assessment and acceptance of the data and also vice chair of our seabed at the moment on the steering committee. So what I would like to talk to you about today is um, is HIP and uh, how HIP is going. We recently achieved a few milestones having completed our first year of operations and uh, achieved our initial operating uh, capability milestone. And then in the second part of the workshop, I'll, I'll talk about HIP and the OS Seabed, and particularly the OS Seabed request tool that we have developed with OS Seabed, and how that feeds into our planning process and, and how that might be of use to people. So just on HIP itself, uh, just a refresher for those who might be new to this. Um, a few years ago, um, a review was conducted of the defences uh, survey responsibilities and uh, defense through Navy has always had the responsibility for uh, uh, the international obligations for life at sea and charting uh, of Australia's air responsibility under the Navigation Act, um, which includes producing charts and undertaking hydrographic surveys. Um, obviously there's a growing uh, demand for a whole of nation uh, a program to uh, significantly increase the collection of hydrographic data and making that data available and, and that has led to uh, programs like OS Seabed, but also the development of HIP, which is a change in the way that the uh, defence is uh, undertaking that responsibility under the Navigation Act and putting the collection of survey activities to support the national task out to an industry panel. So the Hydro Scheme Industry Partnership Program was, was uh, born and it commenced operations in on the 20th of February 2020. Uh, and it came into beam with a, a HIP deed and seven industry uh, 
participants on that panel who will be the hit panel for conducting surveys during the first phase for the first four years. You can see the panel uh, members there. Um, Neptune has now become MMA offshore uh, and all the other members are all uh, listed there. Um, due to COVID, it just created a few uh, restrictions for us very early on. Um, and one of the panel members, uh, DMAL, which is New Zealand based, has not actually managed to uh, participate due to closed international borders, but all the rest of the panel members are very active in the panel and undertaking survey work. The uh, objectives that you can see there and the ones I've highlighted in green are the ones we're really focusing on in phase one. There is going to be a phase two to HIP in a few years time, but at the moment we're really focusing on the EEZ, uh, developing the hydroid, uh, doing uh, shallow water, uh, less than 100 metre survey operations around Australia's EEZ, building and supporting the hydrographic industry and then through generating demand, hopefully supporting development of uh, hydrographic uh, tertiary training and education. Um, all of which is is underway um, and you know we're really happy to see uh, an IHO cap B course being offered in Australia later on this year. So hydro scheme, what is hydro scheme? Uh, hydro scheme is our, our annual plan for uh, survey activities around Australia. Hydro scheme used to be a, a three to five year plan. We now issue it as an annual plan every year in October and it's for the following financial year survey activity. And we do publish Hydro Scheme um, as a story map um, on the uh, AHO website, which you can see there. Um, so all the survey instructions that are going to be issued for contract are actually put up on the uh, story maps and you can actually track the progress on the story maps as, as they are undertaken. Um, Hydro Scheme 2020 was the first one that was issued and that was our first year of operations for financial year 20 to 21. Uh, we issued in the end 15 projects to the panel that we did withdraw two due to COVID restrictions and we uh, completed 13 projects, uh, 12 of those were data collection activities that have been completed. Uh, one is underway which is long term uh, uh, deployment of tide buoys across Torres Strait. Uh, six have been accepted by the HO and four are in appraisal and one is still to come in from a panellist. So we can have a look at, at some of, of the areas conducted. And, and like I said, there are 12 data collection areas. So there's quite a bit of information that would uh, that potentially we can look at, but you can see some of those areas coming through at the moment. And you can see all 12 of the areas were, were um, completed to a very high standard. Uh, but showing that the information like that is a bit static and really what we, uh, uh, moving to is it better ways of doing things so i'm just going to show you the actual story map here for 2020 hopefully you can see that coming through now uh, from the aho website um, and you can see it's very easy to navigate around to see an overview of what we're actually trying to achieve so that was a plan for 2020 and you can see the individual surveys listed across the top here so that initial survey we did which was off uh off darwin you can see that listed uh, the results achieved um, and there is a, a bit of a, a story down the side here about who did it and and the purpose of it. So you can go across and see quite a few of these uh, survey activities. They're all in there um, and, and it's a, a very easy way for everyone to have a look at what we're doing and what we've achieved. Um, and you can zoom in and see some of the quality of the data. Um, and you can see here like, you know, the is, Data is indicating that charts have to be updated. There are incorrect charted features in these areas. So these areas are known for poor survey data. That's why we're resurveying them. Um, so some beautiful data there. I encourage everyone to have a look at it. And you can see some of the uh, quality of the work that has been done. Um, some amazing features down here in Bass Strait, uh, collected by IX Blue um, in a survey. That's still out for processing, but hopefully we'll see that soon. Um, in terms of the vessels we're using, so obviously we're using commercial companies and we're using pre predominantly vessels of opportunity and there's a range of vessels that you can see there. And we've also been using aircraft with LiDAR systems and we've started to introduce unmanned survey vessels as well. So we're really uh, putting out a lot of work and, and starting to see an increase in the number of platforms used, um, which is really good for uh, the industry. 
One of the things we've been trying to do is set up some national reference service areas for multi-beam use. These are uh, reference patches. Uh, we currently have set up and surveyed patches of uh, Cairns, Darwin, Broome, Adelaide and Hobart. And shortly we hope to have some of Torres Strait. Uh, these are being delivered and we hope to have these published on uh, Oz uh, Seabed in the near future. Uh, these are essentially uh, uh, small uh, square patches of, of hopefully flat data though we tend on some of them we try to put them where there's a wreck so people can uh, patch test their um, only beams on a reference surface, surface area as well. So what have we achieved in the first year um, when we've implemented and proven our processes for uh, issuing projects, planning projects, uh, assessing the bids, undertaking the bids, client repping the bids and, and assessing the data as it comes in. We think we're achieving some uh, value for money. We've certainly increased the uh, collection of hydrographic data for nautical charting and just general mapping of the seabed. Um, the focus is on navigational uh, safety at the moment, uh, but we're adopting the use uh, survey once used many times approach. So when we go to an area, we are trying to complete it. Um, we've achieved IRC, which is one of our defense requirements. And you know, in terms of the numbers, we, we've actually assessed 70 odd technical proposals, 100 plus quote spreadsheets, put 13 projects into contract. Uh, we're sounded 70,000 plus linear line miles in a year, almost 4,000 square kilometers of shallow water survey uh, has been collected. Most of the data has been less than 50 meters. Uh, we've deployed 81 odd tie gauges, usually doubled up. So really uh, it's 162, but there's a couple extras in there. Um, and we are also doing GNSS buoy observations wherever we go. Um, so we're doing a lot of uh, uh, work to connect the uh, LAT datum to the ellipsoid and to build the hydroid model. So a lot of activity over last year, but it's been a very successful and thanks to the uh, HIP panelists who have worked really hard to achieve some really high quality results. So that was the uh, background on the uh, the HIP and how it's been, been going. Um, and very successful start and we continue to move on with Hydro Scheme 2021 underway and we're actually planning for Hydro Scheme 2022 um, you know, and that is well advanced now. What I'm going to do now is just uh, talk about the HIP and how we're working with Oz Seabed and, and get into some of the planning processes that we've put in so people can see how we are, are going. Um, one of the first things we did with our seabed was set up the HIP survey request tool. Um, and this is a way for a, everyone to put in a structured uh, request uh, to, to us, um, rather than just uh, an unstructured sort of email approach, which was the uh, routine in the past. Um, so this is now set up in the survey coordination tool. And I'm gonna go through how this works so everyone can understand what the process is. Um, so it's been developed to allow uh, anyone with an interest in uh, seabed mapping uh, to highlight areas of interest to be considered for inclusion into a HIP survey. Um, like I mentioned, it's on the OZ uh coordination tool. Um, and we will also put on the survey coordination tool, we will put on there our uh, HIP focus areas, which are our planning areas, so people can see where we're going and they're in the priority layer on OZ-Bed. And once we issue a hydro scheme, we'll also put up there the planned seabed areas, uh, sea survey areas that uh, are in the hydro scheme. So they'll be on the survey plans layer of Oz seabed as well. And if you look there now, you will see that everything we've done is on there at the moment. Uh, it needs to be updated and that update will generally happen uh, once we release hydro scheme in about November. So just touching on the uh, request tool and, and how you uh, access that. Firstly, you need to be registered to use a survey coordination tool. So you need to sign up to uh, use the, uh, the tool, which requires an email address, uh, a password, you'll get a verification code, and then you'll be able to log into the system. Once you log into the system, you have then have access to the, uh, the three layers in the survey coordination tool, the plans layer, which lists the, uh, the plans where people are planning to go surveying and, and people who are registered users can upload their own plans to tell people where they're going. 
and all our HIP uh, issued SIs are actually in there as plans. There's the request portal, which we're going to jump into shortly. And there's also the priority areas layer, which shows where people's areas of interest are and our broad planning areas are in there as our focus areas. So we're going to um, drill down into the uh, request portal, which is the HIP request area, um, which is how people can express their requests and areas of interest to the my planning team and the AHO. So when you go into the request portal, you have to uh, firstly uh, register your request and we get some, some generic uh, details about the requestor and the organisation who's requesting it. Um, we need the reorganisation uh, and the position of the person requesting because people do move around. So we need to be able to contact uh, the organisation as well as the person who puts in the request because um, uh, the, the uh, planning process and the uh, time to take a survey expands over several years. Um, we asked for a business case, and this is a, 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 a text area where you can justify the reasons for, for a, a survey request. Um, and, and as much information as you can put in here helps us determine uh, uh, the, uh, the need for the area and, and this, the uh, activities being un undertaken in a, a survey request. Then there's an option, an area for uh, putting in your areas of interest, and these can be uh, geojsons or zipped uh, shape files, um, so we can get the information uh, in a, a, a format that we can actually easily ingest into our geospatial processing system. So shape files are good for us. Uh, you can have multiple shape files for one survey request. That we do request that if your requests uh, cover multiple geographic locations, then you put in multiple requests. Um, to cover multiple geographic locations. You can see there, each one can come in and as you can see where it is and we can see it. For each uh, area or sub area, each uh, shape file, uh, you can then specify um, some requirements, uh, which uh, are things such as the survey standard select, which is a predefined field. Uh, you can see here we have the, the HIP orders and the IHO orders. Uh, HIP precise is the same as the, the new uh, IHO exclusive order. Um, so most of our work we do to IHO order 1A, uh, but everyone, you can put for each area what sort of order you want. Um, there's also uh, an overall risk rating that you can apply, and I'll talk about that later, and a preferred time frame that you can apply, um, which you know, we will take into consideration when we look at these requests. And I'll talk about that later as well. Uh, and then you can select the sort of data types that uh, you need collected in the area of interest. And uh, that's the sort of information that is available in the, uh, in the predefined list. Um, at the moment, a HIP survey, we are, are automatically in every area we go collecting bathymetry and backscatter, sound velocity profiles, obviously, and seabed samples. We're doing water column on top of wrecks, uh, and we are doing some other sampling of water. Uh, and you know, we are the intent with HIP is that we will start to do more uh, scientific uh, data collection as an ancillary task to the uh, survey task of collecting bathymetry. You have an option to apply the same uh, requirements for each of the areas that you list in a request, or you can go through individually and have different requirements for different areas, which might make some more sense for each area as you uh, specify what it is that an area of interest needs. So just tying on the, uh, the risk rating here and how we see that, uh, the high risk to us really is a, a sole last uh, requirement, safety of life at sea, or there's a high risk of a grounding and environmental damage. Um, these would normally be associated with a, an urgent requirement in the next one to two years. But when you consider the planning process lasts um, 18 months from planning to when we put a contract in place and someone starts collecting. Um, so we would have to you know, cancel a survey that has been issued to take on a high priority task. So it really has to be a, a, a high risk, uh, uh, urgent requirement for us to do that. 
moderate risk would be more like a, a new charting requirement or some urgent risk mitigation surveys that might need to be undertaken. And, and they would feed into the midterm, which would be you know, the hydro scheme for the next uh, financial year or the one after that. So the justification would have to be fairly high to, to get it into those planning or be in the areas where we're planning to go anyway. And low risk is, is you know, your routine survey activities, your environmental management planning, plan scientific researchers. Uh, the more information we have about these planned activities, we can incorporate them into what we're doing as we go through the planning process, which um, you know, we'd, well, we're looking um, you know, from, from this year to you know, the mid to long term planning, um, and that feeds into our focus areas. So the more information people give us now, the more we can feed into the planning process. Uh, then there's a, sp a spot for uh, any inf additional information you need to provide on sub areas and the more information we have, the better uh, our planning can be. You get to see a summary of what you've uh, put in. Um, all the areas and all the information you can check that before you actually submit it. We do ask that you acknowledge that you have the authority and delegation to submit the request on behalf of an organization. Um, and then you just click submit. So then uh, where does that go? So that generates an automatic uh, supply of the information to directly to uh, my planning team at the AHO. Uh, and we will then consider all the requests we get for the annual planning process. To be considered for the next financial year, we need to have the requests in by the 30th of June. So you know, to be considered for Hydro Scheme 2022, which is financial year 22, 23, we needed uh, any sort of requests in by the 30th of June, uh, 2021. So you can see it is quite a long planning process. Um, after you submit your request, you can actually see where the request is. It still sits in our seabed. Um, uh, so you can see where, what you have put in. So that leads the question of who can submit a request and will HIP do the request. Um, so we're really uh, focusing on you know, federal government agents, state scientific researchers and, and companies and entities that have uh, an interest in expanding seabed mapping as uh, part of the national program to support charting and environmental management. So, you know, targeting shipping companies or pilot companies or other commercial bodies that, you know, would have advantage of the, the, the broader seabed mapping being expanded to support their operations. When we are looking at the requests, um, we, we consider all the requests in an area when we're planning surveys in the area. Um, we have generated our focus planning areas and these have been based on the number of risks and the risks that are associated with an area. So the more requests that we get in an area, the more focus it will get, and the more likelihood that we will start undertaking those uh, survey tasks. Obviously, we look at the high priority and the, the risk and time ratings that people put on their requests, um, and consider that as well. Individual requests are generally incorporated into broader survey tasks. So we produce a survey uh, plan that, that will take on a number of requests, including our own internal requirements. Uh, but if we have requests in the system, we can expand and uh, adjust our survey areas to pick up the requests that are in that area. The requests are used to help guide our survey requirements and deliverables and what data we need to collect. And the point of contacts are, are really useful information for us and we will consult people as we embark on the operations to make sure we're collecting data that will be of use to them. So really the HIP request is, is an opportunity for, for uh, the, the community and users to influence the planning of the National Seabed Mapping Program. So I guess the next question is, is where does the information go? Um, and I said before, it comes into our, our planning system and, and I'll just go through how we are undertaking our planning so people have an understanding of how we undertake the planning process and use the information that may come into us. A schema here of, of our overall planning process. So on the left here, we have the, the LCBED request tool and we now, 
traditionally we've had requests come from other agencies via other methods, but we're really encouraging everyone to put their requests now through the Bed request tool. So we have a, a, a consistent uh, request mechanism comes into our survey planning uh, system. Um, and we have some uh, developed a risk assessment tool over the last year, which we are going to use to try and grade, or we will advise the risk within our planning areas. We have developed some strategic guidance, which has been approved by the Hydro Scheme Review Panel, which gives us some rules around how we plan surveys and what we can and can't do. Um, and we needed a way to bring all that sort of information together. So we, we look at areas of what we call our hip focus areas, uh, which is where we put a focused effort of planning um, and assessment of the, the risks and the requests and the need. And from there, we, we come out with a list of areas that we think we need to survey. That goes to a hydro scheme review panel, which then uh, approves a list of areas that will come out as a hydro scheme annual survey plan. So I'll just expand on some of those so you get an understanding of how uh, all that comes together. We've developed a risk assessment tool, which is a geospatial assessment tool uh, based on the uh, approach that LINS have used. So we've used the work that LINS have done and we've developed it uh, to suit our needs and we're running it on an Australia-wide basis. It uses 12 months of AIS data. Um, it's hosted in a, a cloud, but just an internal one at the moment. Uh, we can set up a series of uh, data layers that feed into a likelihood and consequence factors. And so we're applying the risk from the, the traffic against the likelihood and the consequences to give a risk rating uh, score that we can use to generate a heat map. And we can do this at the moment at a thousand meter grid and a 10,000 meter grid around Australia's EZ. So the challenge was then, you know, how do we, we manage the all of Australia when it's a huge area and you're looking at a, like a thousand meter grid, it's a really challenging way to understand how to use the, uh, the data. So that's why we've developed our focus areas where we can actually apply these tool in a focused area, looking at all the data layers and understand how uh, the risks and the consequences uh, influence an individual area. So the example here of uh, an area of uh, Darwin, um, you can see some of the layers that we've built into this, such as uh, zones of confidence of survey data, survey age, depth, physical hazards, charter routes, tidal range. Uh, consequences include things like sensitive environmental areas, marine parks, ports, agriculture. Um, so it's all fed in to give us a, a risk rating and highlight high risk areas, which in the map there would be red and low risk areas are green. Uh, this is actually an early uh, output from the system. We have been working on it to fine tune it. It's like any system. You need to have the right information going in and have it fine tuned to give you the right results. Um, we're actually starting to get some very good results with it. So I mentioned several times now our hip focus areas and these are available on the uh, Seabed, though they have been updated recently in the last month. So uh, what's on Seabed does not reflect what's on this diagram exactly. Um, but focus areas are, are our planning areas allow us to apply the, uh, the risk assessment tool, look at all the requests and, and all the data layers to come up with a strategic multi-year dynamic planning uh, approach to developing plans for future years for surveys. Um, so the more requests we get in, the more they will feed into request the focus areas. Um, and these areas were developed based on the, the, the overriding weight of requests that we had in the system when we developed the focus areas. So this is where most of the interest is. Um, as you might expect, there's more work than we can afford, even though we have a very large budget. So we have prioritized them and the red ones are the ones where we are predominantly working at the moment. Um, but by publicizing these areas, we're letting the, the community and, and the users know where we're looking at doing surveys. So you, you have an understanding of where we're going and you can input into what we're doing and the quality of what we're getting. And that's the uh, current ones that are on our seabed. Um, and uh, if uh, they will be updated in November to reflect there is an extra request uh, area of Western WA and that was based on requests that we received. So we've generated focus area of WA. So there is a, a 
not the entire country and we could just block off the entire country, but there's a limit to how much we can do um, with the money and with our time. So these are the areas that we're focusing on. That's the whole point. And they will evolve over time, I'm sure. So I mentioned a few times the Hydro Scheme Review Panel, and this is a, a panel of federal government agencies that provide oversight to the HIP and, and how we're undertaking our activities. It's chaired by the Hydrographer Australia. It meets in August each year, um, and we've just had our, uh, our meeting for, for this year. And in August, it reviews the uh, activities in the focus areas, uh, the focus areas themselves, and reviews the uh, any requests that we might have received and it will then uh, approve the planning for Hydro Scheme for the next financial year. So in August this year, we approve the, uh, the well, the HRP approved the plan for financial year 22-23 and the issue of Hydro Screen 2022, which will cover that financial year. That will be issued in late October. So my team are now preparing the survey instructions and the RFQTS documents that will go to the panelists for, to allow them to bid on projects that will be coming out. The, the HRP generally approves an A list, which we uh, issue in October as the Hydro Scheme, and a B list, which is areas surveys that are approved for issue, uh, but not issued unless uh, we have additional funding or we, we have a change in priorities due to unforeseen factors. Uh, such as COVID, uh, border closures, things like that. So, so we have a, an A-list that we put out and a, a standby list of extra surveys that we can put out as well. Um, so that activity has been underway for the last month and we're now into the writing SIs and, and getting ready to go to the panel. So out of that would come a Hydro Scheme. And so Hydro Scheme 2021 actually came out in October last year and is now underway. Um, and uh, so we are continuing. Uh, we have issued six more projects. Uh, five are in contract, one is out for bidding. Um, and we've actually completed one data collection area already. And we have uh, a couple mobilizing the go and wondering where they are as we've now done a workshop we know the Hydra scheme, uh, it can be found on the AHO website. In this case, I've landed on the front page of the AHO website and, and to actually get to the Hydra schemes, it's under this HIP button here. And if I go on to HIP, you can see Hydra scheme 2021. And um, you can see the areas that are planned in 2021 um, and, and where they've planned to be. So you can see in here, Prince of Wales Channel is, is now in contract, but it's not commenced. The survey will undertake this year. Lapisi Channel off Broome, uh, extending the, the shipping route up the Northwest coast is underway. And you can see images there have been updated. Uh, this one was awarded to, to Frugro. And uh, you can see the sort of quality that they're getting. And actually a lot of this data is actually LIDAR data. So uh, the modern LIDAR system collecting some very good data there off Broome. And that slide was there in case the uh, link to the hydro screen didn't work, but it worked. So that's the same sort of information there. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope that uh, made sense to people. Um, I didn't see all the questions fly through the chat, but uh, arrows there can direct questions to me if you would like. That's Michael, that's great. Yeah, uh, arrows been checking on those questions coming through. There's a few here. I just wondered uh, if at first, just to explain possibly to those people who are new to Oz Seabed, that this uh, HIP request tool is, is, is one of the tools, I guess, on the, on the website, that there is another, I guess, way of identifying what might be a priority for a particular government department or particular research institution as such um, in the priority, priority layers. Um, yeah. And also um, the upcoming survey, if you wanted to speak yeah. to that just for a quick second. Yeah, so there is in the coordination tool, there's the priority layer, uh, which is where other organisations can put in their priorities. And, and so you'll see in there, there's other um, layers and we can see those requests and we do look at them. Um, so we can see where we're overlapping with other people's uh, uh, 
priorities uh, going forward. Uh, and that is, there's a project to develop that further as an area of interest layer uh, nationally. Um, and then there's the plans layer where people can put up their plan survey activities. And, and again, we, we do uh, look at that to see what's going on. Uh, but obviously uh, we have a very structured approval process that takes about 18 months. Um, and is, you know, so uh, the, from our point of view, if, if you know, people have an interest in an area, putting in requests uh, gives us um, an interest, uh, an indication of what their requirements are. Yeah. Obviously, people undertaking their own surveys, yeah, and, and they'll do those, and they can publish their plans, and we can see what they're doing. And through our CBED, we're starting to coordinate and talk to uh, all the other uh, interested parties so that we, we're all talking uh, about what we're doing. Fantastic. Well, I like to say you've got 4,000 square kilometres in uh, is it a year or two years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. New South and, Wales, and that's just a start. We're glad to increase that. And, and, yeah, but it is a significant step up. It is... Uh, you know, in terms of line miles, you know, what we've achieved will be similar to what the Falcor achieved. I mean, obviously they're doing deep water, so you achieve a much bigger square kilometage. Uh, but in terms of line miles achieved during the year, I think it's you know a year's work of, of you know, you know, up to you know twelve boats running around in shallow water doing survey operations. Yeah, that's great. It's fantastic. Um, there was a question just a little earlier on about the uh, reference layers. Um, are the reference surfaces bathymetry only? Is there backscatter? Um, and are sediment samples collected? At the moment, it's, it's focused on uh, bathymetry only. Uh, I, I'd have to go back and look at what we received to see if there was samples and backscatter. Uh, we did ask in places for backscatter. I'd have to check. But... Okay, correct. But there's sediment samples and that sort of stuff are being collected as part of um, each of the hip surveys, is that correct? Yeah, that's well? correct. Yeah, wherever we're going, we're doing sediment samples and generating a, like a seabed textures at, at, at a basic level um, as a hydrographic survey. Uh, we see hip collecting in sort of foundation data in the areas we go. So we're trying to get the the the, the multi beam, the backscatter, and, and samples um, to, to have the foundation data layer there um, for the EZ. Yeah, great. Um, so there was a, a question from, oh, sorry, Ari, you wanted to ask? Oh, no, no, no. You've, if you've got uh, the list of questions there, then that's great. Um, we've got a separate yeah, yeah. Uh, sheet. So I've, you keep going, yeah, Tim. So just one from Rod. Um, Nigel, with the AHO hip risk assessment tool be made openly available, there have been a number of attempts to develop the right tool for hydrography, notably from Linz in, in New Zealand, who have done a fair chunk of the Pacific, but there are certainly improvements that can be made. So part question, part comment. It is designed to be our, for other people to, be able to put their scenarios in and, and to be able to use it, but it is, we are still evolving it. So it's not going to be released straight away, um, but the intent is it could be released. It can be hosted in the cloud. Um, so it just needs to be evolved to that point. Okay. And uh, also one from Ralph, how is the progress on the release of the HIP data? Um, to state government agencies potentially making this data open data into the future. And so the um, we're progressing the release policy through um, defence. Um, so the intent is to get to the point where we release data through OSCBED. Uh, but people can always approach the AHO directly for a, a licensed copy of, of any of the data. Uh, but we're working on a release policy so that we can actually release data on an open license to OSCBED. Um, and that is going through the process, but we can't promise anything, anything on that at the moment. Oh, there's a question from Robin that looks like Andrew might have, have answered that. There was, um, is there scope in HIP surveys for deploying underwater video or drop cameras to ground truth some of these areas in these amazing bathymetry surveys? There, there is, and then some of the uh, surveys we are uh, getting imagery of, of the on, on the drop of the seabed samples in some places because it's marine parks we're just doing drop imagery we're not doing seabed samples um, and that's a sort of ancillary data collect that if if it, there's a requirement we can and build that into um, the, the requirements for the survey if, if people see a need for that um yeah just there was just one comment from mark um with the request tool there's no mention of requirements for recreational or oh, not looking at requirements for recreational users I guess, yeah, I mean, on CB, we are trying to engage stakeholders um, and yeah. that as well. Um, it's a difficult one to capture 
maybe as part of uses around um, marine protected areas and marine parks and things, possibly some of those that re recreational requirements get captured. Um, yeah. But it doesn't, certainly the tool doesn't exclude. No, it doesn't um, exclude. General aid people. Yeah. I mean, we're yeah. targeting and aiming, you know, it's at the government level and, and commercial bodies, but we can have feedback from recreational users highlighting areas where there's uh, demand because it all feeds into the uh, building up the uh, a picture of the areas of interest and the demand for activities in a particular area. I mean, obviously there's a lot of Australia and we, we can't be everywhere all at once. Uh, we have to start somewhere. Um, I, I saw there was no sort of a comment about no focus areas in New South Wales, but that's because it that hasn't been identified as a, as a priority um, and through uh, uh, requests. Um, we had a request for uh, uh, Newcastle and we actually did a survey of Newcastle so we will do surveys in areas where there's no focus area it's not we can't do that uh, the focus areas are just a way of us grouping up all the requests and, and applying our planning in a, a detailed way in, a, in, a, in an area but if people see a need for surveys in New South Wales we'll uh, put in some requests and we'll start to see that come through yeah, I guess I'd add to that, you know, the, the marine LIDAR that was run in New South Wales a few years ago is covered out to sort of 25 to 30 metres yeah. um, across most of the New South Wales coast. And I guess Newcastle and well, most of Wollongong has already kind of has had a survey. It was a while ago now, I guess. Yeah. Um, and we're kind of involved in trying to reach some of those gaps. Um, so one final question, it's just, uh, just from Rod. You know, how do you manage the demarcation between that sort of Commonwealth and state water boundaries? Is there a demarcation or, or not really? We're sort of... Okay, so that's, we, we covered that in our strategic rules, which I didn't put up, but uh, essentially, because we have the solace and the uh, commercial shipping uh, and charting responsibilities, uh, that extends into state waters. Uh, so we don't specifically plan to do state waters, but when there's a, a solace or a navigational reason to, to do that, uh, we will go into into state waters. So an example will be the, the South Australian Gulfs and Baxter's Passage, where really it's it's inside state waters, uh, but uh, there's a, a need to update the shipping data, uh, the charts um, in in those areas. Um, so we undertake that work to support the charting program, uh, and and so so it's not a hard rule. It's it's you know, it's a, a, a soft rule and it gets applied as it makes sense to us and the HRP provides oversight on that. Uh, but we're not systematically going to survey the, the state coastlines because the state authorities that are, are doing that as well. Great. All right, well, I think we'll leave it there and um, give everyone the chance to go and grab a quick bite. So welcome back for those who are back already. We might just, just wait a little while just to see who else we've got back online? Hi, Maggie. Maggie, you're ready to go? <laughs> yes. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen, that'd be great. Thank you. Cool. All right. Welcome back, everyone. This is session three as part of today's webinar. And we have Maggie Arnold presenting on updates on uh, Aus Seabed Marine sort of data portal and a bit of a demonstration as well. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. I'm good. Looking good. Thanks. Um, my name's Maggie. I work at Geoscience Australia, and I'll be talking to you about the Aussie Bed Marine Data Portal update and uh, give you a short demo. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that um, the work that Marcus Patton and Kim Picard have done for this um, to go ahead. So today I'll give you a quick overview on the Aussie Bed Marine Data Portal, which allows users to explore and download seabed data. Um, and the result, talk about the results of our stakeholder engagement process, which involved interviews, provided some insights and some recommendations from Marcus. And I'll give a quick demo uh, to give you um, of commonly used functions. I'll leave five minutes at the end of it for any extra questions. So I encourage you to throw them into the chat. So over the past few months, we've been working on um, some user engagement interviews and surveys and collating feedback from our clients based on their experience of the Oz Seabed portal to ask the main question, is, is the portal serving your needs? So we've heard you and thank you for the feedback that you've provided. And 
we're currently busy trying to implement what we can with the funds and resources we have available. So over the past few months, um, we have been making some enhancements to the, to the portal. Um, for example, the clip tool now shows areas on the map. If they contain multiple layers, you can um, split them up and download which ones you like. And this is because sometimes data crosses over multiple UTM zones. There's also um, a calculate statistics for layers that you've added to the portal. And this can be accessed through the in inspection tool. This provides histograms and statistics of the data of those layers. Um, as Scott had mentioned in the chat, we also have an update to the marine sediments tool. So that's, um, so the web service is now live and um, updated every week. It's not a static web service anymore. So it currently is linked to our database and contains about 70,000 samples. Um, I can go over at the end um, where to access this. Um, and there's also the autosave function, which allows users to save their current view and any other open layers on their map. So the results of our stakeholding a stakeholder engagement told us that you wanted to focus on customization. And so what Marcus has recommended is that we have a desktop launcher, which provides a one-stop shop of commonly used functions. So the home allows you to sign in, will allow you to sign in for um, user customization. There's a housekeeping section, which provides you um, information on maintenance windows, any changes or events coming up, um, maps, which allows you to customize your maps and links to priority layers and um, view, view editors and things like that, and collaborate, which allows you to contact us with any queries that you have or if you want to become uh, collaborating collaborative hubs. Additionally, we also found that, if you could, I'm not sure if you can see this part, but um, Users wanted customization of dynamic color ramps or bookmarks, um, dynamic color ramps of the layers that they have added to the portal. They also wanted bookmarks, savable map views, more information on metadata and notifications. So to go over a couple of functions that uh, users commonly went through, the clip tool allows you to download data from areas of interest. So once you've selected an area, it will show you all the data sets available with a link to download the data. So as mentioned before, you now have the option of selecting particular areas to download for surveys that contain more than one layer. So the area will be highlighted on the map um, when you hover over the items. We've also disabled the vector selection and um, this was causing issues before. And it'll also send you an email if it's failed in the process. But if you're wanting to download the whole data set, it might be better off for you to download it from the catalog using the URL in the about section on the associated layer. So there are multiple ways to access data from the portal. Um, to access the portal itself, go through the Oz Seabed website. Um, you can download data via the clip zip and ship tool or ECAT, which is with which is within the layer and the about section. So you can see the metadata record or you can download the GTF here. Um, you can go to the coverage index, which goes to, which links to um, the URL with uh, data, where data is available, or you can use the inspection tool on the portal. So you have to have the layer open first. And when you click on the layer, the inspection tool should come up and will also provide you with the bathymetry URL. So many, many different ways to download the data. Um, so another um, interesting, sorry, another feature that people were wanting to use was to remove layers that were always on by default. So to do that, just click on the layers section then click on the three buttons next to the search and remove active layers. To add layers to the portal, just click on the layers tab at the top, 
then navigate through the themes to add data to the map. So in this case, most of the bathymetry data is within the elevations and depth, bathymetry compilations, or bathymetry by surveys. And in this example, I've added the layer from uh, Bremer Denmark subbasins. So to order the layers, so in order to see one layer on top of the other, you can customize this by clicking on the layers tab, then the three dots next to the search and clicking on active layers. And then you'll be able to drag um, the order, the layer, the layer of the order that you'd like the layers in. You can also add your own data sets to the portal. And these can be within um, your local drive or web services. And to do this, just click on the layers tab and go to the custom layers and choose the options um, that are relevant to you. So what we'll be doing in the next few months is trying to implement the user, these user-driven enhancements. And hopefully I'll be able to provide you an update in December. Um, so thank you for sticking around and having um, joining me after lunch. It's not an easy time. Thanks. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, that's great. Um, I really like that desktop launcher. Sounds like a good way to easy to get in and, and easy to access. That's great. Um, there's not a lot of questions coming up in the in the chat. If anyone doesn't want to type in and they want to just pipe up with a question. We have one here from Sarah. Is there an easy way to search locations using coordinates in the tool? I don't think that that's yet been implemented. <laughs> um, not yet. No, I don't think so. <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, actually, okay, no, you can. Next round. I lie. Manual entry. <laughs> you uh, just go yeah. through manual entry and then um, just put it in via decimal degrees uh, and then search that way. Uh, that's the other thing I wanted to show you. To access the sediments tool, uh, sediments web service, you just let me start afresh. Um, get rid of this. So just click on the layers tab, go to sedimentology, and the web service will be under the Mars sediments database. So you'll see a lot of uh, gray dots because the folk class classification hasn't been applied, but that is the sample point. Um, and you can filter via multiple different um, bits of information here. Yeah. I guess just to mention to those people who are not um, or new to Aussie but joined us relatively recently that uh, I guess there is some idea that in the future that uh, uh, ingesting, say for New South Wales, we, we're collecting sediment samples in a lot of areas we're surveying as well, but to be able to add those other data sets from, from other agencies and um, research institutions and that uh, in the future at some time. Um, if there aren't any There's other a comment questions. here from Sorry. Robin. In adding our own local data sets, projections of data can be tricky. Does the portal require only unprojected geographic WGS84 datum or can it reproject on the fly to match the portal? I would have to ask about that, but if it also depends on if it's a web service or not. I, I'll have to get back to you on that. Sorry, Robin. No worries. Okay, well, there's no further questions. Um, Ms. Kim or Aero had anything to add? Uh, Tim, I was just not sure if your comment was a comment or a suggestion, but when you said about um, bringing data from other states or any uh, data owner in terms of sediment, was that the question or the intention is <laughs> to federate yeah, was, on the sediment too? Yeah, just a comment and that the intention will be in the future to to bring those other data sets together um, and make them available through our seabed as well. Definitely. Yes, it will. Great. Right, so that takes us um, this is into our final sort of part in the final session four for today's webinar. Uh, and today we're lucky to have 
uh, Elise from WA, um, providing us uh, his work on the seismic, 3D seismic derived bathymetry uh, from around Australia. So please take it away. Good morning. <clears throat> and thanks for having me this morning. I'm quite happy to be here and to have the opportunity to present my work. So I am a PhD student from the University of Western Australia. And as part of my PhD, I have been working a lot on the Northwell Shelf to try to map and reconstruct submerged paleo shorelines. And to do that, I basically had to gather and compile as many bathymetry surveys as possible. But there were not a lot publicly available. So I had to try to find new ways to get the bathymetry. And in particular, I used 3D seismic surveys to derive high resolution bathymetry. And it gave some pretty good results. So the idea was, okay, now that we've seen that it's working on the Northwell Shelf, maybe we can expand it elsewhere around Australia. And hence, basically this project, this collaboration between UWA and OCBED to generate basically a national seismic derived bathymetry data assets. So, so the first question of course is, why do we need so badly bathymetry? So here we are all like specialists in one field and we all like have our own applications in mind say, but personally I'm always surprised by everything we can do. Like, and I don't think there's like a week or a month where I don't learn about some new applications. Like we can use it of course to generate navigation charts or as I am doing personally as part of my PhD to try to better understand modern and past depositional environment. We also use it for offshore engineering or to try to better understand benthic habitats. Or for example, in Shark Bay at the moment, we have a project where we use bathymetry to study dolphins behavior. And more recently, we've also started to use it to try to identify and track submerged archeological sites. So there's really a lot of different things we can do with bathymetry. But at the same time, there's not so much high resolution data available around Australia. What you can see here on this map with like the blue coverage polygons is basically all the areas where we have high resolution multi-beam data. And there's only about 25% of Australian waters which are currently covered. And there are, especially in the Northern part, some huge gaps basically. So the question is how can we use other data sets, data sets which were not initially acquired to obtain bathymetry to try to fill some of the gaps. And there are quite a few methods we can use and in particular 3D seismic surveys. So they've been around 350 3D seismic surveys acquired around Australia, primarily for oil and gas explorations. And they cover an area in excess of 600,000 square kilometers. So that's a huge data set and we can use it. And the data is already there. So it's in a sense time and cost efficient to just build on that existing data sets. So the idea behind the project is basically to integrate all of the surveys all publicly available 3D seismic surveys around Australia to generate a national seismic derived bathymetry grid. So the project will be mostly done at UWA in collaboration with OCBED. And we will also try to involve students for other universities to basically use the data also as part of academic research projects and educational projects. The project will be done over two years uh, we are aiming to start it, well, next month, basically. And because we are covering quite a large area, we are going to split Australia into five main sub areas, each centered on one basin. So we're going to have the Bonaparte, Browse, Carnarvon basins, and then the southwestern and southeastern margins. And the idea is that we will process the data within each of these areas and then release it so we can make it available to the public through OCBED as early as possible. So basically, whenever we complete the data, a few months afterwards, we will be able to release it. And also, at the end of the project, the idea is that we're going to use all the knowledge 
all the know-how that we would have developed through the project to write guidelines on how to produce seismic derived bathymetry. Because at the moment, we have not found such documents. Like quite a few people are deriving bathymetry from seismic data, but typically they will only do it on one or two surveys using their own internal methods. The only compilation I can think of was done over the Gulf of Mexico, but they didn't really publish a guidelines or detailed methodology on how they did that. So it would be really important to prepare this document. So the idea behind this presentation today, because well, we haven't started the project yet, is that I present you the workflow and the method that we intend to use to try to engage with you and to see first to collect any feedbacks and to see if you have like any suggestions on how we could improve the methods, things that we may do differently because we may have blind spots, of course. And whatever we do today will then be used as a basis to then prepare the guidelines in the future. So when I'm talking about seismic derived bathymetry, there are actually two very different things. So what most people have in mind is actually what I would call reflection derived bathymetry. So basically picking the first reflection from the seismic data itself. And this is what most people do. But another way we can also derive the bathymetry from the seismic data is by using the navigation files associated with the survey. And in this presentation, I will be presenting both methods and then how to compile them to obtain the final 3D seismic derived bathymetry. So first, the reflection derived bathymetry. As I was saying, this is something which is done commonly by geoscientists on individual surveys. And what people typically do is that they will use a software like Kingdom or Petrol, for example, and they will pick manually every single inline and cross line of the survey to extract the bathymetry. This is a very time consuming process. And also because this is done manually, you cannot really like reproduce it or it's hard to QA, QC, and you can have errors. In our case, we are gonna use a very different method. We are going to use PaleoScan software instead. This is a software which is fully automated in which you basically define a search window. And within that search window, the software will track down on the traces, all of the different peak and throws, and then connect them through neighborhood analysis. And you can then extract any horizons, any surfaces you are after. And in our case, this is a bathymetry. And that process is quite efficient. Like the example that you see here on the screen is an area in excess of 12,000 square kilometers. And we can process it within a few hours. And it's mostly running in the background. So we can process multiple surveys at the same time. But this, of course, is done in the time domain. And one of the critical parts when processing bathymetry is to convert the data from the time domain to the depth domain. And one of the main issues with seismic surveys is that we don't have access to site-specific velocity profile. So we cannot really use like dedicated velocity models. So the key question is how can we work around that? What most authors have been doing so far, and myself when I was working on the Northwell shelf, I did that, is using a constant velocity of 1500 meters per second. The reason why people are using a constant velocity is because first, given the average water depth of seismic surveys, you usually don't have such a high error. Like you can see, for example, here in that table, a comparison between a constant velocity and site-specific velocity profiles. And we can see that when you are like between 750 or 1500 meters of water depth, the difference with between like site-specific velocity profiles and constant profiles are actually not that high, that high. The issue is mostly in shallow waters or very deep waters. The other thing to consider is that the vertical sampling rate of seismic surveys is at best of two milliseconds and often of four milliseconds. So by default, you already have this uncertainty. So when you have a vertical sampling rate of four milliseconds, having 0.05% uncertainties due to the velocity profile is not that much of a big deal. But still, how can we improve it? How can we do better? And 
I've discussed recently like with Rob Beeman and he suggested that we use the SVP builder, which is a software which may have been produced like a while ago by Ifromer and then redeveloped by some people at CSIRO to generate synthetic velocity profiles. So that could be a way to improve the model. Uh, but where we need to be careful is that we don't really have a control on the uncertainties associated with that tool. So what are the uncertainties associated with the MetaOcean data used as input to generate a profile? And then with the formula itself used to derive the profile. So can we be sure that those uncertainties are better than what we have here? Or is there any other method that we could use to obtain like accurate velocity profile? And on that point in particular, I would be really interested to have like your inputs from your experience. If you know of any like databases or anything where we could good, where we could get accurate velocity profile from, or is it better to use constant velocities, synthetic sound velocity profiles? That's really an open question. So once we've converted the data from the time domain to the depth domain, we can then grid it. And to do that, we are using the inverse distance weight algorithm. And the resulting, resulting bin size basically corresponds to the resolution, like the spatial resolution of the seismic, and is usually between 12.5 and 25 meters. So it's pretty good. And you can actually see here two examples. And on the left, you have the regional bathymetry, so the Australian bathymetry and topographic grid from Geosense Australia. And here on the right, what we get from the 3D seismic data. And what we see is that in deep waters, the results are amazing. Like we can really see like all of the details, all of the features on the seabed. In shallower waters, well, it's still good. Like we can see the seabed features, but we can see that there are quite a few artifacts which are affecting the data. And I will talk a bit more about that later. So the other way we can derive the bathymetry from 3D seismic surveys is by using the navigation data. In a sense, it's not different from using any open source, crowdsource navigation data. The only difference is that here, in the case of 3D seismic surveys, because they acquire like the seismic data along tight grids, we have a pretty good coverage. So the way it works is that here you have the seismic acquisition setup with the vessel, the sources, and all the receivers. And basically, whenever a short point is fired from the sources, the depth value, which is recorded by the vessel echo sounder, is allocated to all the different elements of the systems. And we can then use that information to derive the bathymetry. One key thing to keep in mind is that some of the elements, for example, the receivers here, they can be located like hundreds of meters, if not thousands of meters behind the vessel. And yet, they get the depth value from the vessel. So it's really important that when we use navigation data to filter the data to only keep the coordinates of the vessel allocated with the depth measurements made on the vessel. Because if you don't do it, you end up with basically acquisition bands, which are offset from one another simply because of the distance between whatever point you are using and where the data is actually collected. But if you filter it, then you get a very nice result. The reason I insist so much on that correction is because over like recent years, there have been a couple of databases which have been developed to try to extract navigation data from 3D seismic surveys. Well, they've not been updated in a while, but the main issue with those databases is that they did not actually correct for that effect. And most of the surveys have this issue which is why here in our case, we are going to basically start fresh uh, to make sure that all of the surveys and data are processed the way we want to be. So once we have the data, we can then generate grids. One limitation with navigation derived bathymetry is that the navigation data is already in the depth domain. So we don't actually have control on how it was converted from the time domain to the depth domain. And in most cases, we don't have the information on how it was done. We maybe have this information for maybe half of the surveys, roughly. 
And when we have that information, they typically use a constant velocity. So if we have the information, we can always back calibrate the data using whatever relationship we decided to use. But if we don't, well, there's not much we can do. So after we grid the data, we can see that the results can be quite impressive. So you have once again here two examples where we have on the left, the Australian bathymetry and topographic grid, and on the right, what we get from the navigation derived bathymetry. So very clean results. What is interesting is that here, this is a shallow area, which I was showing earlier, and the results is much cleaner than with the reflection derived bathymetry. If you look carefully, you can see that there are small artifacts on the grids, and it is simply to do with the geometry of uh, the pattern of the acquisition system. So, because basically, when the navigation data is acquired, you will have like gaps between adjacent acquisition lines. So we need to be careful about that when doing the grading. One thing that can sometimes be an issue when we are using navigation derived bathymetry are incorrect recording. So it does not happen that often. Uh, this survey is maybe the worst I've seen on the Northwell shelf. And we can really see all of those artifacts which have nothing to do with the actual water depths. So when the depth values, as it is the case here, are completely off the charts, it's relatively straightforward to filter them out. But the thing is that in most cases, as you can see here on that other example, the incorrect values are only off by maybe 10 or 20 percent. So it's more challenging to remove them. And it's important to do it because if we don't, a user could think that those things are pock marks, but no, they're just data artifacts. So I have myself think about a few ways we could filter them, but before trying to like write new scripts or new algorithms, I was wondering if you know like any tools uh, that we could use to do just that. So I'm assuming based on the Quark's presentation that there are probably some discussion we can have uh, to basically use already existing tools instead of trying to do everything from scratch here. So the reason why we want to use both the navigation and the reflection derived bathymetry is simply because they provide different information. There is not one that is better than the other. What you see here are two cross sections which have been extracted on the Northwell shelf, one in shallow waters and one in deep waters. You can see here the black line, which corresponds to the multi beam bathymetry, so, in a sense, the reference bathymetry. And then the green line corresponds to the navigation derived bathymetry, and the blue line to the reflection derived bathymetry. And what we see is that in shallow waters, we have a very tight fit between the navigation derived bathymetry and the multi beam data. But the reflection bathymetry is really not that great. We have like quite a few artifacts, and the relative heights of the seabed features are completely abnormal. But if we look here at that cross section in deeper waters, we can actually see the opposite trend. There's a very good fit between the reflection derived bathymetry and the multi beam. But the navigation derived bathymetry is not that great. It's over smoothed. We don't really see the seabed features. So what this means is that we need to use both methods and to combine them to basically get the best results over any given location. So the last step, the last processing step is basically to calibrate the vertical datum of the data sets. In theory, all of the surveys, navigation data, or seismic data are already reduced to the mean sea level. In practice, that's not the case. If you look here at this map, you can easily see between adjacent su surveys that we have offsets in the color scale because you have offsets in the data itself. So to correct that, we are using AHO depth soundings, which we converted from LAT to MSL. And we then compute a narrow model between those AHO depth points and the seismic data to then shift it vertically and correct it. There are some areas where we don't have enough uh, AHO depth soundings, in which case we are using random points extracted from the multi beam surveys instead. So once all of that is done, we can either provide the files as individual grids 
also merge them to obtain a regional seamless grids. And you can see here the example of what we've done so far on the North Pole shelf. And this was mostly done using uh, navigation data, actually, because at that time we didn't have access to all of the seismic surveys. The last key point, of course, is how accurate the data is. So to check that, we've extracted in excess of 10,000 points from both the seismic direct bathymetry and the multi-beam bathymetry and plotted them against each other. And what we can see is that we have a very good fit with a coefficient of correlation of one that I had never seen before, to be honest. So we do have a mean average error of about seven meters, but this should be put in perspective with the depth range of the data, basically. So I would say pretty good results. Before concluding this presentation, I also wanted to mention other methods we could explore because there are quite a few things we can do to obtain bathymetry using already like data, which is already there. Like, for example, we could also use 2D seismic surveys. There are literally loads of them around Australia. So we might be able to get something there. And also we could use, why not satellite derived bathymetry? We had some pretty good results on the Northwell shelf and managed to get about 45,000 square kilometers of data. But of course, the water clarity was absolutely perfect. So we may not be able to do that everywhere. So to wrap up this presentation, I would say that the key point is that we need high resolution bathymetry through multiple fields, like not only for navigations, but there are really lots of things that we can do using high resolution bathymetry. And it's expensive, it takes time to get, so we can capitalize on surveys which were initially not acquired to get bathymetry to try to obtain, say, multi-source high resolution data. And using that workflow, we should be able to obtain a national seismic derived bathymetry data sets. And we expect to be able to start releasing some of the data by mid-2022. And we hope that these data sets and the guidelines which we associated with it will support the development of such methods. So for the, thank you, thanks a lot for your attention. And for the discussions, I would be really happy to hear like any feedbacks on the project, what we are trying to achieve, and especially towards like velocity models and outlier removals. If you have any questions, contact me on my email. Thanks. Thanks, Felix. That's great. Fantastic. Really great to see all that work and how it's expanding out into all those other areas. And yeah, uh, there's been quite a bit of, uh, inf I guess, questions going around on the chat. So I might um, open it up to the floor. And there are a few questions there that Ulysse has for everyone um, with regards. Let's maybe start with the sound velocity profiling and the issues yep. um, associated with that. So we had a something maybe Stuart Edwards, if you'd like to turn your mic microphones on um, and ask those questions directly that, and maybe that might generate a bit more discussion. Um, Stuart or even Yusti had some um, contribution to talk about with regards to that sound velocity profile. Hi, Tim. Hi. Yeah, it was just, um, I think everyone, uh, there was a question there from Ralph about, uh, I think what Noah used, but we, I was just, um, just saying that the SIRA SVP builder uses the same uh, World Oceans Atlas model that the NOAA software use, which you might already be aware of. So, so, sorry, I didn't quite hear what tool you used. I think there was some, uh, Ralph was asking the question in the chat about um, oh. what NOAA used for, for the SVP builder profiles. But yes. if you've already used the, the, the SIRA SVP builder software, then that uses uh, the same underlying model and that's also the same underlying model that the doris software uses so it's exactly so, atlas. so that was my understanding that the csiro svp builder is actually an earlier version of the doris software that's uh, correct and which is why i wasn't sure like what to do with the uncertainties because since it's based on the woaa um meteor ocean model the thing is what are the uncertainties of this model? And what are the uncertainties associated with whatever formulas are used to derive the sound velocity profile? And can we be sure that those uncertainties can be quantified and if they are not too high compared to just using constant velocities? And I just don't know, basically. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so there are actually, as I put that into the chat, and then with the uh, uh, correspondence with you, uh, read lately, uh, Ulysses, uh, I think the one that you mentioned is the old one that's using the, uh, there are a few databases that they actually use. There's some climatology data, and they are also using some uh, historical data. So, but in Doris or even in the NOAA Hydrographic Office SVP, you are allowed to actually choose whatever database that you use. And they also provide you with the, the information on the, um, on the, um, the, the uh, uh, sorry, the formula yep. that they use. So it's worth, it's worth while uh, exploring these, these, these things more, I think, uh, because it's not just like I think the one that you that I ref, uh, the, the one that you refer to the old one is only one is if I'm not if I remember correctly it's only a one um, database which is the the climatology data yep. but the late the recent one you yeah, provide you with more uh, with a bit more um, um, database I guess okay. So in that regard, just on this slide here, I did use uh, Doris to get the synthetic velocity profile. And this is that profile on the Northwell shelf, which I used to get um, those like error values, say, compared to like constant values. Uh, but that was based on the WOA database. And of course, if we can use instead more like local databases that would be much better, of course. So I will definitely look into that. Thanks. So sorry, thank you, my ignorance, I guess. Um, they, sorry, that, that, that NOAA base thing is, is a model of, so it is the climatology that's come up with. But is there any, as Australia, we have, I guess, the Atlas of Regional Seas and, and sort of more sort of, uh, I, whether they're higher resolution spatially um, climatologies, uh, just so, to, is that contributing to, to part of this um, sound velocity um, characterization, I guess, for different parts of the country as well? Or is it just based on this NOAA, um, this NOAA model? So that's actually the issue because by default, it's only based on the NOAA model. So we don't have any local data points. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, which is why basically I was questioning it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's certainly there's, um, certainly within the IMOS community, there's a, a real, uh, I guess, that knowledge gap to go back. And, um, you know, there was the sort of national uh, 3D models that were built for mm -hmm. oceans around Australia, you know, sort of some, some time ago and, and blue, um, what do they call it? Blue, um, Sorry, I've, I've lost my train of thought. Um, but anyway, to go back and, and reanalyze and, and bring in all the new data that's been collected in the last 10 years and, and also create uh, models that are, I guess, higher resolution over the shelf um, rather than just being sort of, you know, an equidistant grid type oceanography model over, over the whole of the Australian uh, area. But um, anyway, that sort of thing, I guess, isn't funded yet and, and might be something that comes in the future, but that doesn't, doesn't help you just, just yet, I guess, um, just now. <laughs> Um, so Robin's got a comment here. So you did a quick calculation on your quoted vertical uncertainties of two milliseconds for every 1500 meters is about plus or minus three meters, pretty good. But as you show there are, it does vary near shore and offshore, offshore and doesn't always follow in those steeper areas. Um, Ian suggested that sound velocity profiles can potentially be inverted from seismic data, but this is not a trivial exercise and it might not be robust over lots of different data sets. So, um, yeah, thanks for that comment, Ian. Um, Ulysses, there are many congrats for your good job and success. One question, what do you think about the bottom response against sonar frequency differences, such as air guns or echo sounders? Well... You explored those options? No. <laughs> yes, so, no, so basically this is something um, which is quite interesting and it's related with the sound velocity profiles. Because one thing that I noticed on the Northwell shelf and on some data sets, which I cannot show today, is that in some areas, basically because the difference in velocity between the soft sediment 
and the water column is not that high. So basically in the water column, it will be like 15 something and the soft sediment will be maybe 1540, something like that. Uh, sometimes what you get from the seismic here, you will not actually capture the seabed, but you will capture the first hard layer. And on the North Wales Shelf in particular, what we have is that we have, say, maybe half a meter of soft sediment. In some cases, it can be like a couple of meters of soft sediments, and then hard cemented calcarenite. So on your velocity profile, you have a velocity of 1500-ish in the water column, the soft sediment at maybe 1540, and then the calcarenite at 2100. So because of the vertical resolution and of the length of the pulse using, used in seismic surveys, the difference between the water column and the soft sediment will not be strong enough to generate a response compared to the difference between the soft sediments and the hard calcarinite. So what you will capture is not actually the seabed, but the substrate below the hard sediment. And there are some areas where it's quite funny because when you look at the multi-beam, it's all flat. But when you look at the 3D seismic derived bathymetry, you can see like channels, like all channels which have been filled since basically. Um, so this is something which has, like I have observed it, but it has not been published or really explored so far. But there could be some quite interesting studies here because you could use in areas where you have both to basically try to extract the thickness of the soft sediment, basically. Um, but this would need, this would require like more work. And I was mentioning earlier that we are going to try to engage students in the project. So basically for each of the area of interest that we've defined, the idea is that we have like uh, students working on them in parallel. And that is definitely like a question that, that we have to explore basically. What exactly are we measuring? <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll take that. So another question um, might be related. Uh, what is the specific difference between using petrol and paleo scan to pick up the seabed horizon? Well, the main difference is that in softwares like petrol or Kingdom is the same thing, is you actually have to manually map the seabed. So basically you have to, on your 3D seismic volumes, you will have inlines and cross lines. So you have to manually open every single inline and then manually pick the seabed to tell it is here. There are some, say, methods which help to automate that, but they are mostly based on interpolation rather than actually scanning the data. Whereas with PyoScan, you just define a search window, and within that search window, it will generate an horizon stack. So basically, it will model all of the different changes in amplitude of your choices to generate a grid in which you can extract each uh, horizon, so each surface. But basically that process is full, fully automated. All you have to do as a user is basically define your search windows and the search parameters. You don't actually have to manually do the interpretation. And, by, and the software is quite robust. So you gain a lot of time there, basically. Okay. So question from Christopher, can you filter out low frequencies so deeper reflections are minimized? Yep, so that's something which I've done. Uh, so basically um, for the general public, basically with your seismic data, it is based on a range of frequencies. And typically for the oil and gas exploration, they are mostly interested in frequencies around like 40 Hertz to target the reservoir. Um, but the pulse itself also includes frequencies which are as high as 100 or 150. And you can basically try to filter the frequencies and this way enhance the resolution. Because here, what you see here is based on the main frequency, which is like around 40, 50. And if you shift that frequency range to higher frequencies, you can improve the resolution. So I've done that on a few surveys and it gives some interesting results, let's say. Uh, so what this means is that uh, in deep waters, it does not change much simply because you have the water column which, which acts 
as an infinite medium. So the pulse is not that much of an issue. And in shallow waters where we can have those weird artifacts, it does help to circumvent them, but it also creates other artifacts. Uh, so basically you start to have like uh, jumps in your horizons because basically it's much harder for the software to, to get, basically the signal to noise ratio is not that good. So yes, in some areas you will improve the results, but in some others you will start to have like weird behavior. So it requires like some very fine tuning and it takes a lot of time. So that's something we might explore in very shallow areas because it might help us, but it will have to do like on a decision basis. Like we cannot do it like in a systematic way on every single surveys, basically. So yeah, still some interpretation and some nuance yeah. between different areas for sure. Uh, so yeah, Ian's asking, is the software open source that you're using? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but they do provide some like academic research license. All right, so I guess um, I open up the floor back to the question with regards to the artifacts in the, um, is it, it, was, it was in the, the GNSS data, was it, that it was collected so, creating those artifacts? So it's mostly related, like we don't have such artifacts with the seismic data, simply because all of the traces were already processed and issues like that were already corrected by um, the company or the entity who acquired the data. So it's mostly with navigation data because for like the seismic, like they acquire the seismic, like the navigation data, but they don't actually do much with it. So they're not like processing it, cleaning it or anything. So, so, so it happens sometimes that the data is very rough like that. Okay. Um, on the North West Shelf, I've processed in excess of hundred survey. It has really been an issue on only two surveys. Uh, so we can always walk around it. But yeah, I was wondering if there are like any suggestions on how we can improve that filtering basically. And if there's like any tool that we could use any like. So is it generally that the, the detail of the, of the navigation data that's collected is, is, is not as, I guess, you know, with some of the new multi-beam systems that we're operating with pause and we're able to go back and, and you know, provide, do those SBIT um, type of smoothing functions. Yeah. Now for a lot of these data sets that doesn't exist, is that correct? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> okay. uh, does anyone else, anyone else want to step in and um, ask a question? Yeah, unmute yourself and um, if you've got any advice. Otherwise, um, we can provide it to your list at a later time. Uh, can I make a, a general comment, please, um, Tim? Certainly, Mark. Go ahead. Yeah, look, um, look, I think this is really good. and. At the end of the day, what it sort of is talking about is uh, using other data sources to get our bathymetry. And um, but but it was interesting at the start of the uh, presentation, one of the there was almost a default to multi-beam as as if you like the go-to data source. And uh, in some areas, there's a lot of ALB, and I don't I think we need to make sure we don't forget that. You know, for example, we we're talking about New South Wales before the whole coast has been done by ALB out to about the 30, 25, 30 metre um, contour. On the Northwest Shelf, there's a lot of uh, ALB between Shark Bay and past Caratha and from the Abrolhos down south to um, yep. um, Cape Naturalist. And that was collected for Landgate and, um, and, and some of it was collected commercially for companies, but um, a lot of the licences have expired and, and, and certainly for... You know, the AHO's got the data, the um, um, Landgate's got the data. Um, and, um, and, and if there's any data that can't be available, we can always create a license for a specific use. But it, it's sort of interesting that, that I noticed on one of the, the, the images, there was some um, seismic collected inshore and um, inshore of um, um, Barrow Island uh, to the east and southeast. Well, there was actually an ALB survey that precluded that seismic survey to uh, enable yes. that data to be collected. So in a way, we, you know, we're interpreting all this seismic data, which is good because it, there's seismic data in other areas. But at the end of the day, we're interpreting the seismic data to get the bathymetry, but the bathymetry was actually collected to enable the seismic thing to, um, to be, be done in the first place. I'm just, 
um, waving the ALB flag yeah, yeah, in no. one light arbor <laughs> making sure that people are aware of it. So you are absolutely correct. And when we're working like to do like bathymetric compilations, we did include um, any sort of LiDAR data we could get our hands on. And we made it available when we had the license to do it. Um, but the thing is, where we have access to it, the data is absolutely amazing. But the reality is that in terms of actual coverage, in terms of number of square kilometers, it's actually not that great. I mean, it's amazing for local studies, but for regional studies, like to give you, like for example, you were talking about Barrow Island. So here, there's a survey which I think was acquired by Fugro in 2002, like between 1998 and 2002, which extends from here to here. Uh, so that's a great patch, but that's only first in shallow waters. So that would cover like the white area here and not all of the deeper areas here. And then over this area, we only have like small patches here and there. So yes, that data is amazing. Yes, if we can use it, we should use it wherever we have it. Um, but in terms of coverage, it does not go anywhere near what we can have with the 3D seismic data. And the I last thing- yeah. Sorry, I understand Commander Townsend would like to collect a lot more. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And the thing is, with the 3D seismic data, it's or with other method like the satellite derived bathymetry, those are very like low hanging fruits because the data is already there. So all we need is just like the manpower and the computing power to do it. Like so, in terms of costs, it's nothing compared to like going out there and doing an actual survey, basically. If I may no, step no, no. in here. <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> all of these data and Mark, you're right. Again, we want to encourage all open data and sharing through OSD bed. I think this is, is a, I know Langate has it. We're still working out how to add those contributing hub, um, but obviously anything that's not open license, um, you know, we try to encourage to open it because others can use it easily. Otherwise, every one of us will get pinged with multiple requests to get a specific license file to them to work on. And then again, it, it doesn't help that, that, that big distribution. So hopefully we get to that point um, where we can have all of this data collated into one spot or made easily available. Um, so seismic or ELB, I totally agree. We should have that all out. We just need a bit more. Uh, Staffs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks to you, Liz, for all your answers and um, um, attending to those. There's a few more there as well, but I can't think we're, we're hitting 125, and I'm just conscious that uh, that's the time we set aside. So I hope to have some of those questions answered for you and some more discussions to happen or to ensue um, following from this conversation. So just to thank you, everyone who's uh, new to our seabed for coming along and um, and also for those who uh, have persisted with us over the last couple of years and think we're making real headway, which is great. Um, there are more workshops to come over, over this uh, first half of the, of the uh, financial year, I guess. Um, so please keep an eye out for those that are coming up. One for those people who are able to provide uh, data to the Seabed hub. Um, and then another one with some funding from NESP around the national areas of interest and prioritization. So, Thank you everyone for attending. If you want to catch up again, you can go to the website and um, download and and watch parts of it again if, if you really want to. I uh, hope you do. Um, and yeah, we we'll see you next time. Um, please continue to engage and your feedback is, is really important to us to know as to how well Seabed is doing. Um, so please um, stay engaged and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks.